Sometimes it's not only those who are missing that need a voice. It's also the ones who have fallen victim to murder. The ones whose killer or killers are free to walk amongst us as if nothing ever happened. The cases where justice has yet to be served. And sometimes the evidence all points to a particular killer, but still that person walks free with the ability to do it all again if they choose. And they will. For 21-year-old Libby Caswell, everything that happened in room 319 of that seedy motel may have died with her on that fateful night, the night of December 11, 2017. But the room itself and the circumstances surrounding Libby's death tell a very dark tale of the abuse that she endured leading up to her death. And now it's up to her family, friends, and everyone who loved her to be her voice. This is the case of the suspicious death of Libby Caswell. And this is Gone in a Blink. Hey, true crime fans. I'm your host, Heather. And I'm Danielle. Welcome to episode 20 of Gone in a Blink. I hope everyone who celebrated had a wonderful and safe 4th of July. Danielle, did you do anything amazing for the 4th? I did. I went to the Royals game and then they had a great fireworks show after the game. We actually had some friends and family over and had a pretty chill evening, to be honest. My husband always goes all out and usually smokes something out on the smoker. However, this year, our puppy, which is actually a 100-pound Rottweiler, decided to eat the cord to the smoker. So, (laughs) needless to say, we didn't use a smoker this year. Oh, man. that (laughs) is that part of the reason that he had surgery not too long ago? (laughs) (laughs) No, that was totally something different. But we forget that she's a puppy. She's... She's massive, but then you remember, oh, she's chewing She's chewing the cord off the smoker, so she's still in that puppy phase. So today's case is out of Independence, Missouri. Today, we are talking about the very suspicious death of Libby Caswell. So if you're ready, let's jump right in. Elizabeth Caswell, also referred to as Libby, was a young and vibrant 21-year-old with a big heart. She was a former high school cheerleader who loved music, dancing, gymnastics, but most of all, she loved her family and friends. Her son, Alex Xavier, was her entire world. Unfortunately, she also loved her former high school sweetheart, a man by the name of Devin Martin. Libby and Devin's relationship was tumultuous, and Libby was struggling with her own demons. However, she was beginning to get her life back on the right path. She had been working with a caseworker in the hopes of becoming more involved in her young son's life. And unfortunately, however, she could not stay away from Devin. In an interview with 41 Action News in Kansas City, Libby's friends described Libby and Devin's relationship as abusive and said Devin had a history of being verbally mentally and physically abusive to her. Libby had made the comment to her friends on more than one occasion that she was scared for her life. And her and Devin, they had an on-again, off-again type of relationship. Like so many abusive relationships, it seems to be a situation where when things are good, they're really good. And when things are bad, they're really bad. A lot of times, I think that's why it's so hard for the one enduring the abuse to leave because they begin to remember how good it seems when things are really good and they forget or try to ignore just how bad it can get. The couple would often stay at Libby's parents' house. However, things would frequently get out of hand and the police were frequently called to the home over domestic disputes. Several incident reports showed that Libby's mother, Cindy, called the police numerous times while the couple were living with her. 
So much so that, according to reports, in 2013, police labeled the Caswell home as a nuisance property, and Cindy Caswell was ordered to pay a fine. And honestly, I didn't even realize that that was a thing. Did you know that? No. So, okay, I'm confused a little bit. You're saying that the police had to show up there so many times that they ended up fining Cindy for how much they had to go there? Yeah, that's what all the reports that I found showed. And that's why I thought it was so strange because I didn't know that was a thing unless it was a situation where they were being called for nothing. I could see like, I I don't know, maybe, maybe a situation where... If a child kept calling or pranking 911, you know, something like that, I could understand a situation like that. But if there is domestic abuse going on in the home and the police have to keep coming out there, to me, that makes no sense that you would label that a nuisance property and then fine the property owner. Like, how much would you even charge for that? I mean... The police are there as a public service. So I'm kind of with you, Heather. Unless they are going there so many times over nothing or like in a domestic violence situation, they've maybe asked maybe Devin in this case to to leave the home or and he won't or Cindy won't kick him out. And then they still have to to show up because they're not following the police's recommendation then I guess but I, I've never heard of that either that was that was very new to me but then I I begin to question why the boyfriend was allowed to live there in the first place but it quite possibly could have been a situation where if Cindy told Devin to leave she knew Libby would go with him and maybe this was her way of being able to keep tabs on her daughter I, I mean I'm not sure but Trying to put yourself in that position, I'm sure Libby probably would have went with him, and she knew that. Cindy Cindy knew that. So yeah, I could kind of see that. So maybe Cindy, and of course, this is all speculation, that she'd rather have them in, in the house where she can keep tabs uh, on what was going on than to let her daughter be alone with him, and then she wouldn't know what was going on. Absolutely. So it's a tough situation. As a parent of a child falling victim to abuse to really know what to do and how to protect your child in that situation. I mean, Libby was an adult at that point. So unbeknownst to Cindy Caswell and everyone who knew and loved Libby, her life was about to meet a terrible fate on December 11th, 2017. Early that morning, Devin and Libby checked into the Sports Stadium Motel in Independence, Missouri. And I'll post a pic of this motel on our social media page, but to just kind of give you a visual, this is a pretty raunchy motel. It had been reported that a friend of Devin's was there that night at one point and that they were consuming a large amount of drugs and alcohol. This was allegedly, though. At some point in the day, Devin and Libby allegedly began fighting about Devin's alcohol and drug use. According to Devin, Libby decides to take a shower sometime around 11 a.m. and Devin falls asleep while waiting for Libby to get out of the shower. Devin claims he woke up around 8 p.m. and didn't see Libby in the room. He then says he notices a belt sticking out on the outside of the bathroom door. He tells investigators that when he opened the bathroom door, Libby fell to the floor with the belt still around her neck. He said he checked for a pulse, and when he couldn't find one, he began to panic and called 911 while racing to his dad's house. Police arrived at the scene shortly after the 911 call was made and found Libby in the bathroom of the motel room. She was wedged in between the toilet and the bathtub and was found lying on her left side. Rigor mortis had already set in and her body was stiff, which indicates that Libby had been deceased for several hours prior to the police being called. She had blood coming from her nose and her feet were pinned up against the bathroom door. Police later discovered that the belt found around her neck was Devin's belt. 
The motel room itself was in complete disarray with clothes and alcohol bottles scattered all over the floor. Police interviewed a witness who was staying in the room next door to Devin and Libby's at the motel, who claims he heard what sounded like a man and woman fighting just 20 minutes before police arrived. He claims that he heard a woman's voice saying, quote, please stop hurting me, unquote. Investigators quickly came to the conclusion that this particular witness was not credible because it appeared that the man was impaired and there were inconsistencies with his story. And I think one thing in particular is the fact that the witnesses claims to have heard a couple fighting just 20 minutes before police arrived doesn't really match up with the fact that rigor mortis had already set in on Libby's body and the fact that for this to have been possible, she would have had to have died several hours earlier. How many hours is that that rigor mortis sets in? I think it probably depends on a lot of factors, like if the body is in the elements if, if the body is out in the heat, that type of thing. But the reports that I found said it had to be at least several hours. So to me, several hours is, I don't know, anywhere between three and seven hours. I, guess, I was going to guess four, like three or four hours. And that would follow your timeline as Devin had reported. Well, I guess, you know, you could go a lot of different directions with that because from the time that he called police around 8 o'clock, and they, they got there pretty quick, but it had already set in. So when he's claiming to have found her, well, he's claiming that he fell asleep between 11 a.m. and 8 p.m. So if what he's saying is true, and that's a big if, then it's possible that she could have died shortly after he fell asleep. And then when he found her, rigor mortis would have already set in. So when police first began investigating the scene, it was originally investigated as a homicide case and police were confident that Libby had been strangled. When police arrived and began investigating Libby's case, Devin was nowhere to be found. Police immediately considered Devin a person of interest and were actively looking for him. Then, several hours later, at around 10.45 p.m., Devin showed up at the police station and an interview was conducted. I did think this was really strange that he would realize that his girlfriend didn't have a pulse and call 911, but he also just fled. To me, he just fled. Whether he panicked or not and he ran to his dad's house, he never, to my knowledge, anything I found, he never came back to the scene. But instead, maybe his dad was like, you need to go to the police station. But he doesn't show up till 1045. I don't know. I think that that kind of sounds typical of what he was doing. So he was drinking. There was drugs. Probably he... Felt like if he stayed there, he was going to get caught for those things. So running to his dad's, and I, I think that you're right, is probably his dad or someone worked on him saying, okay, you need to go to the police and, and talk to them. Devin claims that Libby was suicidal that day and had been drinking vodka all morning. His friend that was there that night backs up his claim. However, toxicology results performed on Libby do not support this claim. The results actually showed that there was no alcohol in Libby's system. Devin also told investigators that he was exhausted from being up all night on the night prior to Libby's death and that he had fallen asleep around 11 a.m. on the day of her death and slept until 8 p.m. He claims that Libby had been showing signs of depression and had been making suicidal threats. Devin denied, and still does, any involvement in Libby's death. The Jackson County Medical Examiner determined that Libby's death was due to asphyxiation and due to the circumstances surrounding her death, the manner of death was listed as undetermined. According to a report on the Uncovered website, Libby's case was ruled a suicide and then closed by the Independence Police Department. This, however, doesn't sit well with Libby's mother, Cindy, or anyone else who knew Libby and her boyfriend and knew of Devin's violent background and his frequent drug use. 
Caseworkers working closely with Libby, as well as several of Libby's friends, reported repeated incidents of domestic abuse that Libby endured at the hands of Devin. And it was reported that Devin had tried to choke Libby on multiple occasions. And on one particular occasion, there was a witness to this. After Libby's death, a witness came forward and told authorities that Libby and Devin had been staying with him at his house in Kansas City, Kansas. And one week before Libby's death, on December 4th, the witness told police that a loud noise woke him up. When he went into the bedroom where the couple were, he saw Devin on top of Libby with his hands around her throat and he was trying to choke her. After this incident, the man told police he kicked both of them out and hadn't spoken to them since. That day, Libby's caseworker had met with Libby and her son and she noted that, quote, Libby was upset and appeared shaky and unkempt, unquote. Libby told her caseworker about the incident that happened earlier that day with Devin trying to choke her. And after this incident, Libby's caseworker began looking for women's shelters for domestic abuse for Libby to stay in. However, she was unsure about going to one of these. So I've done some work with domestic violence victims. And it it is, it's a tough thing as far as when they come forward saying that they've had domestic violence. There's so many people, believe it or not, that experience that, men and women, that a lot of the domestic violence shelters are full. So it gets hard to find a bed for, and what I mean by that is some place for them even to stay for the night. Uh, and, and unfortunately, that can kind of defer people a- away from even, you know, coming forward or going to those domestic shelter places. Even though once they're in, there is enormous amount of resources, whether legal services, uh, food services for a woman or a man in general. But if they have kids with them as well, that, that makes it harder to find a shelter. But again, once they're in, they have those resources for the children as well. And it, and it does really help. Well, and the fact that so many of the shelters are so full just goes to show how big of a problem domestic violence truly is in our country and many other countries as well. I mean, when you've got all these shelters that are put in place for people dealing with this and they're all full, we've got a serious problem. Well, and that's what's hard too, is that you hear on on one end, oh, I don't even want to try to go to a shelter because I'm not going to be able to get in. And so while that's true, to a certain extent, you always want to try because they they don't just leave it at that. Oh, sorry, we're full. No, the workers will try to find you something else. If she had a caseworker or even her son had a caseworker, they would work to try to find her someplace else. And if there was no place else, they wouldn't leave her in that situation, even, you know, through the police department. I've also heard of in the local Kansas City area, the police department renting a hotel room for domestic violence victims, even for just the night, so that they could get out of that situation. I think it's just the fear for these victims of going into the unknown and taking that first step to break away from their abuser. And it kind of goes right back to what I was saying earlier about they remember no matter how few times there are that are actually good they go back to those memories oh you know i mean he's not like this all the time or she whichever because it goes both ways they're not like this all the time and then they start to think about the good times and it's so much easier just to stay and deal with the bad times no matter how deadly they can be versus taking that step into the unknown and finally breaking away. It's just, it's a hard, hard situation. Friends and family of Libby's say there is no way Libby committed suicide. Many believe that the Independence PD did not investigate Libby's case thoroughly enough and that they just wanted to plant a quick label on it so they could close the case. Cindy Caswell has pushed hard for her daughter's case to be reopened. 
she contacted an organization called Alliance for Hope International, which is a California-based organization that helps survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, child abuse, elder abuse, and human trafficking. It also provides training to police and first responders on these issues and how to recognize the signs. Dr. Bill Smock is the medical director for Alliance of Hope's Training Institute on Strangulation Prevention, as well as the police surgeon for the Louisville Police Department and directs its clinical forensic medicine program. Dr. Smock was asked to take a look at Libby's case and said, quote, I took a look and I was very concerned with what I saw. There are multiple reasons why this case should be opened. There is clear evidence that this was a murder. The scene was staged based upon the injuries I could see on Libby's body, unquote. Dr. Smock goes on to say that the mark that circumferences Libby's neck is not consistent with a hanging and that when someone dies by hanging, you will see an inverted V mark on the back of the neck with a space nearing the base of the skull. According to Dr. Smock, the circumferential pattern on Libby's neck indicates that Libby was strangled. According to an article on Fox 4KC, Gerald Feynman, a retired prosecutor working for the Justice Project and looking in on Libby's case, stated, quote, They took at face value from all the suspects in the case exactly what they said, and they never tried to corroborate any of that information, unquote. Feynman also stated that the Justice Project found evidence suggesting that Libby was strangled. He is quoted as saying, quote, there was even a footprint on Libby's back, evidence that she was strangled from behind, using that belt as a pressure instrument to restrict her breathing so that she couldn't breathe. So she didn't hang herself, and the evidence is quite clear on that, unquote. Feynman also stated, Quote, we believe that it is common for the Independence Police Department to quickly rule these cases as suicides because that ends their investigation. That's what they did in Libby's case, despite the evidence to the contrary, and we think that's occurred in other cases. We are aware of a couple of them, unquote. Now that's scary that they're aware of them and they think there's more, that they're not looking into these cases that means that there's a lot of people that have, are, com you know, that committed murder. I mean, there is anyway that's walking around. But these people are doing these these murders and making them look like suicides. And the cases aren't being investigated like they should. And so these men or women who are committing these crimes are walking around free. Well, and that's a pretty bold statement for this guy to make. And so for him to make that, that tells me that he's concerned about it and was honestly trying to use that a, a little bit as a platform to get the word out. Hopefully with that, the independent police will maybe pay a little more attention to this versus just trying to close the case. In the same article by Fox 4KC, Casey Gwynn, who is the president of Alliance for Hope International, said that the photos of Libby's body revealed injuries all over her body, as well as ligature marks on her neck and chest. Independence Police Captain Mike Anka has worked to reopen Libby's case, and he believes her case has raised many flags. He reported that when officers arrived on the scene, the outside door into room 319 was locked and officers had to break it open. He said the bathroom door was also closed and the light was turned off. Another red flag was the fact that rigor mortis had already set in, indicating that she had been dead for several hours. And Captain Anka also brings up the fact that at autopsy, Libby's legs and feet were in the same position as they'd been found when they were up against the bathroom wall. According to Anka, Independence PD originally considered Libby's death a homicide However, other authorities who were at the scene had different opinions, including the medical examiner's investigator who disagreed with the initial claim that it was a strangulation. He disagreed that it was a strangulation rather than suicide? He disagreed that it was a strangulation. That's what they were originally 
ruling it as. They were originally investigating this as a strangulation case. And Captain Anka is saying that other authorities that were on the scene, including including the medical examiner's investigator, disagreed and thought it was a suicide. And the investigator for the medical examiner said, this is a suicide. And I think that right there is why they switched it. Now, what made him think that? I mean, I guess there's a lot of factors that made him think it, but I don't think that it, it doesn't sound like it was investigated thoroughly enough to really go with that. Well, right. So, I mean, kind of backtracking a little bit, like you said, that they found a footprint on her back. So, I mean, I could see where he thinks, okay, that this is a strangulation. What I'm concerned about is why didn't the coroner consider that? I really don't know. I I mean, you would think that's a, to me, that's a, a big thing. I mean, that's really key to determining the manner of death. When you have a footprint on your back, that clearly indicates that there was some kind of scuffle of some sort. So I don't know, but they switched their direction in investigating and decided to go with suicide. One thing that could have been key to this investigation is the motel's surveillance cameras. This could have pieced together a pretty neat timeline. However, Captain Anka claims there was an issue finding and collecting the footage. And why doesn't this surprise me? So many times you hear of cases where surveillance footage could have played a major role in solving a case, but more times than not, either the video cameras weren't working that night or the footage is too grainy and nothing can be made out. I don't know what the issue was in this case, particularly with obtaining surveillance footage, but in a motel such as this one, there is a lot of very sketchy activity that goes on in and around there. So working cameras should be high on the priority list. But unfortunately, I don't think they really care too much about that type of thing. No. If anybody is familiar with that area, I kind of feel like there's a lot of crime that goes on at this motel with a name Stadium Hotel. And especially now that we are a two time Super Bowl winner, I just had to throw that in. <laughs> um, that, I mean, if someone is wanting to come from out of town and stay someplace, they would maybe see that online and think, oh, that that would be okay. And it's just sad. Of course, they have surveillance video. But like you were saying, not just here, but lots of places that it, it always seems to not be working, that so much could be maybe solved or at least be helpful from that footage. No, I totally agree. I totally agree. That could have painted a bigger picture of the timeline. And I don't know what the situation was, why they couldn't get the footage, but they, they couldn't. So... The Jackson County Prosecutor's Office has since released the following statement. Quote, The Jackson County Prosecutor's Office has worked closely with the Independence Police Department and other law enforcement partners to review the death of Libby Caswell on December 11, 2017. Our sympathies go out to her family who wish to know what happened to their loved one. The Prosecutor's Office reassigned a second veteran prosecutor, to review the case a second time, but determined that the evidence was insufficient to justify criminal charges for multiple reasons. That prosecutor's determination and findings were communicated to a family member earlier this year. We are grateful for the investigation by members of the IPD and the work of the FBI. The Jackson County Prosecutor's Office has worked diligently to determine how Libby's life ended and whether criminal charges were supported. We will continue to look at any new evidence, unquote. So that was the prosecutor's office statement. So here is the Independence Police Department. They have issued a statement as well. Quote, the Independence Police Department responded to a suspicious medical call at the Sports Stadium in 9003 East U.S. 40 Highway, on December 11, 2017, at 8.15 p.m., officers notified investigators and they responded to the scene. The scene was held until detectives could interview witnesses and or persons that may have been in the room at the time. Once investigators determined there was no need to hold the scene and no arrests were appropriate at the time, 
the scene was released. However, the investigation continued. During the course of the investigation, the case was reviewed by multiple detectives within the Criminal Investigations Unit. At one time, the case was reopened at the request of Elizabeth, which is Libby's family, and Alliance for Hope International. The FBI assisted IPD during that investigation. The case was presented again to the Jackson County Prosecutor's Office to determine if there were any criminal charges to be filed. Detectives believed that given the evidence that was available, Elizabeth Caswell's death was most likely a suicide. The Independence Police Department welcomes any witness statements that have not already been given to investigators. We also welcome investigation by an independent party regarding this case, unquote. So they're pretty much standing by their determination that Libby's death was a suicide. Libby's family and friends continue to advocate for her. They've created a Facebook group called Justice for Libby, and I will post the link to that page in our show notes as well as our Facebook page. Devin Martin continues to maintain his innocence and states that he had nothing to do with Libby's death. What do you believe? Let us know on our Facebook page, Gone in a Blink. Really like to hear everybody's thoughts on this one. If you know anything about the suspicious death of Libby Caswell, please contact Crime Stoppers at area code 816-474-8477. I really hope that the Independence Police Department does take a much closer look into Libby's case. I believe there are way too many discrepancies to ignore, and given Devin's history and the details of the crime scene, along with the fact that he left the scene and didn't even go to the police station until more than two hours later, I just don't see how these things can be ignored, and I hope that Libby's family gets the closure that they deserve. Thank you for listening to another episode of Gone in a Blink. We would love for you to follow us on any of our social media sites. You can check us out on Facebook at Gone in a Blink or Instagram at Gone in a Blink Pod. And if you have an idea for a show you'd like us to cover or if you have a loved one who is missing and you'd like us to cover that case, drop us an email at goneinablinkpod at gmail.com. And as always, please remember, be safe, be smart, and try not to blink.